Good morning. Good to see you here this morning. If you're visiting with us, then we want to welcome you as our honored guest. We would absolutely love it if you took out one of those cards that you see in front of you, fill that out, and you could either give it to me in the back after the service is over, or you can put it in one of those little black boxes there in the back of the auditorium. That's just, just, just so we can get to know you and you can get to know us and we can express our appreciation for you being here with us this morning. We often say all things are possible with God and that God has the power to change anybody, even the most vile, worthless kind of sinner. Uh, but I often ask myself, uh, and, and I've been asking myself this uh, recently, as I experience weakness and failing within my own Christian walk and, and Christian experience, God, have you really seen me? <laughs> Somebody like me. I mean, Somebody that will bless your name one minute, come to worship service and, and, and magnify and praise and glorify the God of the universe, and then the next minute lash out in a fit of impatience. <laughs> Have you seen somebody like me? Maybe you've asked yourself that before. Patience. Patience. That's, that's what we're going to talk about this morning because the fight for it is a very real and very difficult spiritual battle that encompasses the Christian journey and experience. We're going to talk about how we can win that battle and that war and glorify God through perfect patience, which He desires all of His children to be like. So this morning, let's first ask the question, what is impatience? Where does impatience come from? What is impatience by nature? Take out your Bible with me, uh, if you will, and turn to the book of Numbers, chapter 21, verse 4. We're going to read verses 4 and 5. Numbers, chapter 21, verse starting in verse 4. This is from the New King James Version. It says in verse 4, Then they, the Israelites, journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. Now, in the original Hebrew text, this last sentence of verse 4 literally reads, but the souls of the people became short. Now, to become short in spirit is a common Hebrew expression that's used all throughout the Old Testament to communicate the idea of impatience. To become short in spirit communicates the idea of impatience. And this is something that we can also relate to within our 21st century culture and lens because we have a similar expression that we're all familiar with in English. We are, by the way of example, tempted to get short with the immensely annoying robocalls that keep calling and calling and calling and calling your cell phone wanting to sell you a car warranty that you have absolutely no desire to have. It's very tempting to become short with that, those kind of calls. So, what does it mean to be short with someone? It means to lose your patience with them. It means to let go of your endurance and express your discontentment due to the other person's negligence. That's what it means to be short in spirit in this way. Now, notice the outcome of the Israelites' impatience, the outcome of them being short in spirit. Numbers 21 Verse 5, look with me there. It says, And the people spoke against God. They spoke against God and against Moses. And they said this, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water. And we loathe this worthless food. I mean, even after, even after God had given them blessing upon blessing, 
even after God had given them good things, he defeated their enemies, he delivered them from slavery, he's leading them to a fruitful and a productive land. He gives them protection all along the way and guidance and food and water and strength to defeat all of their foes, all of the Canaanites. And even through all that, through all the blessings that God showers and showers and showers upon His children, they get short with God. They become short in spirit with God Himself. Why? Why did the Israelites become short? What would possess, what would possess someone to lash out against a God that had given them nothing, that, that had given them no, nothing but blessing? in their life. And, and not only that, but, but a God who promises to continue to give blessing upon blessing and had never at one moment or instance broken one of the promises that He had made to them. Why did they allow their souls to become consumed with impatience when they had all the evidence in the world that prove the fact that a trust in God, despite their seemingly negative circumstances, was the best way to go. Why would they become short in spirit even after all that God had done with them? And the answer to that vital question as we attempt to discover the root of impatience is this. It was because deep down in their hearts, they wanted to be the ones in control. They wanted to call the shots. They wanted to be in the sovereign command seat, having the power to govern each and every one of the circumstances that came their way. They didn't want in their heart of hearts to live in full submission to and, de and dependency upon another power than themselves. They wanted the power to control their own situation. And in essence, they wanted to be God. Their impatience only revealed the contamination of pride that was present within their own hearts. And brothers and sisters, that, as we attempt to discover what impatience is, what its source is, that's what impatience is at its core. It is a desire for control, a desire to be in control of one's circumstances. Our, our hearts, they often speak, I want to be in control of my situation. When I'm on the way back from work and the traffic is backed up for an hour and I become impatient, our hearts often speak, I want to be in command when my children refuse to acknowledge what I'm trying to tell them, and it causes em embarrassment uh, for me out in public. Our hearts often say, likewise, I want to be sovereign over my circumstance when, when interruptions and inconveniences arise that, that just make life difficult and rob me of my happiness and joy as I define it. Oftentimes, when we're confronted with the fact of how little control we actually have in this life, what is our response? Our response is often grumbling. Our response is often anger and frustration and impatience because deep within our heart of hearts, here's what's going on. We want to be the ones that call the shots. Like the Israelites, we forget God's blessings. We forget His continued guidance and healing and comfort and peace that encompass our life, and we believe in our hearts that if we had, if only we had complete control, then life would be so much better. That's what impatience is at its core. It's a desire for control. Notice what the writer of Proverbs says in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 29. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 29 says, whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. Now, hasty temper 
in this passage is the same Hebrew expression that we read about in Numbers chapter 21, short in spirit, literally. Those who are short in spirit, who are impatient in their hearts, this text says, they exalt, they lift high, they raise high foolishness. And another word that you could use for that is stupidity. They raise high, they lift high foolishness and folly and stupidity. Those who are short in spirit. Why? Because it's completely and utterly foolish, this text says, to believe that things would be better if I had control. I mean, just think about it. Humanity has made a wreck of its existence, have ma has made a wreck of its life, has made a wreck of its eternal existence because we believe from the very beginning that things would be better if we were in control. That was the very first sin of Adam and Eve. But thanks be to God who loves us despite our rebellion and offers us a better way. Now notice also with me what this text says in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 29, at the beginning of the verse. It says, whoever is slow to anger has great understanding. Those are the ones that have, those, those are the ones who are wise, who have great other understanding. In other words, whoever is patient, whoever waits on God's timing, that's the one that has great wisdom. That's the one who has great insight. And why is that? Because the one who is patient the one who refrains from being short in spirit is the one who trusts in God's sovereign control. That is a wise person. One who trusts in God's goodness and promises uh, and, and surrenders to His order of things and to His sovereignty and His control. That's a wisdom and that is an understanding that will lead to true happiness and will lead to true and lasting fulfillment. So, as we continue on this journey, let, uh, we, we know that the battle for patience is a very difficult one, and we know where, it, well, where impatience originates from, our desire uh, for control. So, how do we fight? How do we fight the battle for patience? And how do we fight the battle to become all that God desires us to be? In short, you fight the battle for patience this way. You fight by surrendering. You fight by surrendering. Notice what Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, a passage that we're all familiar with. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 23, the fruit of the Spirit. He says in verse 22, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now notice here that patience is a fruit of the Spirit. Patience is a product of the Spirit of God. Patience, it's not produced by our own power. It's not produced by our own initiative. It doesn't come about by our own strength and our own might. The problem of impatience, as we've talked about previously, it can't just be fixed by changing, by simply changing a few of our bad habits or, or avoiding certain scenarios and situations. The problem of impatience within you is so severe that you need a complete makeover of heart and mind which only God can accomplish through the Spirit, which only God can produce. Remember what the prophet Ezekiel says concerning the new covenant promise in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26 through 27. He says in verse 26, And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Brothers and sisters, the gift of God, the gift that God gives to you, God gives you many gifts, but one of the primary blessings and gifts that He showers upon you is the blessing and the gift 
of a new heart. Our hearts are so corrupt, the Bible teaches, due to sin that we cannot possibly live in fellowship with Him without His intervention and His healing resurrection power. God Himself performs a work within His children which enables them to love Him and serve Him, the Bible teaches. It's God that sanctifies and produces the beauty of His own righteousness within His people. And that includes the perfect kind of patience that He desires all of His children to possess. So, perfect unadulterated, complete patience. The perfect and complete kind that uh, it, it, it doesn't come from us. It doesn't come from our own power and strength. Patience comes from the Spirit of God who produces it within us. Patience is a fruit, a product of the Spirit. And that's very important. That's crucial to remember as we fight for patience because the fight, it can become very difficult, very strenuous at times, fighting uh, for patience when, uh, when, when, when inconveniences and interruptions arise. I mean, patient, be, being a patient person can be very, very difficult. And all of us as God's children, we need to know and we need to remember that we have on our side this all-powerful, all-loving God who is doing more inside of of us at this very present moment than we can even fathom. We need to keep that in mind as we fight for patience. Our responsibility in this process, in this process of sanctification, in the process of the Spirit producing patience within us, is to step aside and allow Him to perform heart surgery, essentially, within us. Our job in this process is to surrender to His power and to His will. As Paul says in the, in the chapter, to keep in step with the Spirit and allow Him to transform us from the inside out. That is how we fight the battle for patience. We surrender to the will of God and allow the Spirit of God to perform a sanctifying, continuous work within our hearts. But how do we do that? How do we surrender? Here are three manifestations of surrendering that will help us as we attempt to keep in step with the Spirit and allow Him to produce patience within us. Number one, surrender to the Spirit through humility. Notice what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 through 2. He says in verse 1, I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Humility, humility, sweet humility at, at its core, what it is, it's an admission of how little we can see in any given moment, however difficult or intolerable that moment might be. Humility says when you're in the Walmart line at the self-checkout uh, part and, and it's backed up all the way to the produce section, humility says, well, maybe, just maybe, maybe God is doing something through this situation. Maybe, just maybe, God is leading me to somebody to encourage, to uplift. Maybe He's leading me to someone through this delay, through this inconvenience, so that I can share my faith with them. Or quite possibly, maybe, maybe this delay is because God is possibly protecting me from an intoxicated driver out on the parking lot that, that's going to run me over if I were to just, if I were to just whiz on through the self-checkout line. That's what humility does. It admits that I don't have it all figured out in the moment. I can't see the big picture. And humility believes that 
God is working, that God is at work. And, and that's how we fight. That's how we surrender to the will of the Spirit. When temptation, when the temptation of impatience, for that desire, when that desire for control is festered within me, when, when, when something happens, how we fight that is by humbly saying, I can't see. I, I can't see all of the uh, inner workings, all of the nuances of, of this situation. I am surrendering to the power and the will of God who might be doing something grand, marvelous, and beautiful through this seemingly in, um, inconvenient situation. That's how we fight. Um, now, secondly, how we surrender to the will of the Spirit. We surrender through faith. Notice what James says in James chapter 5, verse 7 through 8. He says... As Nolan read for us a moment ago, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. What faith does is that it holds firm to the promises of God even when the circumstances of life call the promises of God into question. If you're a farmer, if you maybe have a garden in your yard, you know that farming requires waiting and trusting that the rains will come, and uh, so does the Christian life. It requires waiting. It requires trusting. Faith trusts that God is in control and that He's good even when the ground of my situation is as dry and dusty as a bone. Faith believes, faith believes that God works all things together for good to those who love Him. When life is disrupted, when inconveniences arrive, when we, when we receive that fearsome diagnosis or when the loved one that we had passes away, we have faith. We surrender to the work of the Spirit when we trust, when we have faith in the power of God that He's working, that He's doing something, that He hasn't left me alone. He hasn't left me hanging. He's constantly working in my life. And we fight this battle for patience through that faith, through trusting that God is working even in me, when it, even when it doesn't seem like it in the here and now. And then lastly, as we close, we surrender through joy and fight this battle for patience through it. Notice what Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 11. Being strengthened with all power, according to His glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy. Patience with joy. True faith, the Bible teaches, is not merely trusting in Bible verses, robotically reciting them to myself when, whenever negative occurrences happen or tragedy strikes. True faith, true genuine faith, produces a reaction within us. It produces an experience of overflowing joy because it sees the beauty and wonder of God's amazing grace as it really is. God reassures us over and over again that my grace, what I've given you through the blood of Jesus through His cross, is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you, God, sa God, God says to us. My, my grace, he says, gives you a reason to experience joy even in the midst of your inconveniences and even in the midst of your interruptions. And if we want to be a people that surrender to the Spirit and allow Him to produce patience within us, we need to be a people that see God's grace for what it is. Beautiful, more beautiful and majestic than even our negative circumstances and respond to it when, with joy, even when inconveniences halt our current 
progress. That's how we fight, brothers and sisters. We fight by surrendering. We, f- we surrender through humility. We surrender through faith in God's workings, and we surrender through joy, knowing that God's grace is sufficient despite my inconvenience. We say that all things, all things are possible with God. He can take an impatient heart, mold it, shape it, and transform it into the kind of heart that displays the perfect patience of Jesus Christ Himself. And we know the character of our God is that it is His pleasure and joy to do so. Surrender to Him today and be changed into His likeness. Be conformed into the image of His Son. Surrender to Him and know the joy that He brings. This morning, if you have any need, uh, if, if you know that you don't have Jesus Christ, uh, the, the inv- His invitation, not mine, but His invitation to you this morning is to believe that He is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except by way of Him, to believe that with all of your heart, to repent of your sins, to do a 180, to do things God's way. And we set aside a time this morning where you can actually come forward after I step down here, and you can confess your faith in Jesus. And right now, you can be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins, contacting the blood of Jesus Christ and know the joy that He brings. Also, if you're hurting in any way and we can bear your burdens and and lift you up to God in prayer, uh, if if you're hurting in any way, you can come forward and make that known as we stand and as we sing.